All right. Well, good morning, everyone. How many of you guys are ready to find some joy today? Oh, pathetic. I knew it. You guys aren't ready. Uh, are you guys aren't ready? Um, but, I mean, honestly, though, I mean, I feel like probably some of you guys walked in here and you probably weren't feeling very joyful, right? Um, probably you had some other pains in your life, some experiences that are just hard that are you're going through. And, and so, uh, again, that's perfectly understandable. Sometimes you come to church on a Sunday morning and Maybe you got in a fight with your, your spouse or your kids, right, on the way over, right? Or maybe maybe you've just been going through something difficult, and you just had to even to be here today. You had to drag yourself out of bed, and you had to wake up and like, okay, I'm going to put some clothes on today. I'm going to do this, right? Sometimes just going through that pain is hard. You know, when you think about painful experiences, I mean, one of the most painful experiences, at least physically, that you could ever have would be like being in the birthing room, right? Or especially if you're the wife, you know, the husband, eh, I don't know. Um, but hey, I remember when uh, Haley and I were having our first child, right? And Haley was going through all the contractions and things, we're in the room. And Haley is like, I mean, she was so strong. She did it without any like medication or painkillers or anything, just had a per- natural birth. Uh, and I remember we were, were there, and my whole job, and I've told some of you guys this before, but my whole job was just to stand there, hold her hand, right, as she squeezed it till all the bones broke, but hold her hand, and then, like, to hold this rag, like, across her face, a cool, like, rag across her face. And so I was there doing that, and it came to point in the time, this, again, this was our first baby, so I didn't know exactly what to do, and it came to the time when the contractions were just, like, full force, right? They were, like, full on. And so she's just starting to like a little bit to freak out a little bit and just go, you know, just freaking out. And I'm just like, it's okay. You can do this. Just breathe. And she's like, shut up like that. Right. Uh, and I was like, okay. And then um, th- seconds later, the nurse walks over and goes, it's okay, honey. You can do this. And she's like, okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Right. Uh, just shows the difference there. Right. Um, <laughs> And in this life, right, we experience all different kinds of pains, right? We go through physical pains, we go through emotional pains, we go through relationship pains. We just go through pain a lot in this life. And, you know, pain without purpose, it's just pain, right? It's just pain. It's just worthless. It makes us feel worthless. It makes us down, right? And pain without a purpose is just pain. However, what we'll discover today and what we see in the scripture is that pain with a purpose all of a sudden becomes worth it you know when we're living our lives for jesus's glory in every single area of our lives all of a sudden even the pain that we're going through in our lives has a purpose through it and it's something that we can find joy through even when we're going through pain and so today we're going to be looking at the topic is finding joy through the purpose of pain So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to start off in verse 12 today. Philippians chapter 1 in verse 12. And just to kind of remember, Paul, when he's writing this letter, it's towards the end of his life, right? He's coming down on the end of his life, and he's actually in a Roman prison. And so he writes to this Philippian church, a church that he had started several years before, and this is what he writes in verse 12. He says, but I would that you should understand brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. So the first thing he says here is that I want you to get this. I want you to understand this. I want you to wrap your mind around it and comprehend what I'm about to tell you. Right? He starts off this book and he talks about the friendships with them, the joy that he has with them. He goes into these three different things that they could do to pursue Jesus. But along with that pursuing of Jesus came this pain, and they're seeing that. And so he's like, I want you to understand this. I want you to be able to get this. And he says, these things. Now, what things are he talking about here? What things is he talking about What he's referring to? Well, we know from Paul's life that he did not have an easy go at it. Actually, his life became significantly harder after he started to follow Jesus. Right, He went through crazy amounts of pains after he started following Jesus. A lot of different difficulties. In his letter to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians, Paul kind of gives a list. Right, The Corinthian church there, the Corinthian, Corinthians were very well-off people. And they started to even have this like this doubt about Paul. And he, so he gives them a list of everything he's gone through just in his following of Jesus. And so this is what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak of a fool. I am more. So he's like, yes, I'm definitely a minister of Christ. And then he goes into this list of everything he's had to go through. He says, in labors 
more abundant. In stripes, that means in beatings, above measure. Too many to even count. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, often. Like Paul was even, one time he got stoned, dragged outside the city because they thought he was dead. And he came back to life through the power of God. Right? He was, he was revived. But yes, he faced death even so many different times. And so he goes into this even more detail in verse 24. It says, of the Jews, five times I received 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That's what I just said. Three times I suffered a shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the seas, in perils among false brethren. He went through peril everywhere. Basically saying, no matter where I went, no matter what I was doing, there was hardships and pain that was coming into my life. And then verse 27, he says, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, in cold and nakedness. He says, besides all those things, besides those that are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So he says, besides all the other just pains that I'm being experiencing from everything outside this world attacking me, he says, I'm also daily having to deal with all the churches that I'm ahead of and dealing with drama and dealing with people and dealing with relationships and dealing with the oversight of all these churches. He says, there's a lot that's going on in my life and it's a lot of difficulty and pain, right? That's, it sums up in that verse 27 where he says, in weariness and painfulness. He said, I'm tired, right? Often, and I'm going through this pain. Paul's life was really, really hard. And it was filled with all kinds of painful experiences, even though he was trying to follow Jesus with his life. Even though he was passionately following Jesus, doing everything, his whole point of his life was wrapped around the mission of Christ. And even though he was still suffering this pain. And this is, this is an important point that we got to really internalize and take home. Jesus does not offer us an easy, painless life. That's not what Jesus is offering to us. He's not offering this easy, pain-free life. We're going to have pain in this life. This life is, this world is broken, right? It's broken by sin. It's broken in the world. It's not perfect. And when we get ourselves into trouble sometimes is we start to think that the world is supposed to feel like heaven, right? We start to think that our world and our lives are supposed to be perfect. Right? That there's not supposed to be difficulty, that things are going to go well. There's not supposed to be these challenges. And if we have that in our mind that, hey, this is abnormal, this is weird, that I'm going through this pain, then all of a sudden that pain creeps upon us and then we get into this depressed state because we think it should be like heaven. But it's not like that. We live in a broken, painful world and so we're going to experience this pain. But, but what Jesus does for us is he offers us something else, something different. And I would argue even something better. See, Jesus gives us a life where our pain that we're going through can have meaning and have purpose. It's not just just useless. It can have meaning behind it. See, he says here that the things he's went through has a purpose. Again, in verse 12, he says, I want you to understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather. The reason they happen, there's purpose behind them for the furtherance of the gospel. What that means is he says, I'm going through this pain, I'm going through this difficulty, but they all had this end result that the gospel kept going for. It furthered the gospel. My painful experiences even led to the gospel going out more than it would have otherwise. And this is a good question for us to answer, ask ourselves, and it's a hard question to answer, though. Would you be willing to go through pain if it meant more people could hear of Jesus Christ? What type of pain would you be willing to go through if it meant that just one more person could hear the good news of Jesus Christ? It's a hard question. It's not an easy one to answer. Um, when, I was, when I was growing up, I don't know if you guys ever watched this show, um, but we watched with Joe Rogan Fear Factor. Anybody ever watched Fear Factor? Okay. We watched this show a lot when I was a kid for some reason. Um, but basically, Fear Factor is, is set up like this. It's a game show for uh, contestants to play. And basically, they have these three different challenges that you have to go through that involve some type of fear or pain or hardship or something like that. 
So usually it would start off with like you have to lay down like in a bed of snakes or something, right? That would be like the first challenge. It's just freaky. And then the second challenge always involved like eating something really strange. So like you'd have a full plate of like live cockroaches and you have to just down those, right? Which was disgusting. And then the last one you'd have to like drive a car off a skyscraper or something like that, right? But each one of those things involves some type of pain, some type of fear, some type of hardship you had to go through. But here's the thing. If you stayed in the game, you accomplished every task, then at the end of that game show, then you won, right? You won the prize. You got the money. You won big. And what Paul's point is, is this. He's like, yeah, I'm going through pain. It's not easy. This life is hard. It's difficult. But here's the thing. The way he lived his life, he said, this has a purpose for it. Every painful experience I go through has a meaning. It's leading to the joy in my own heart and the joy of others as they experience Christ. See, his pain actually led to results. Look at at this next verse. In verse 13, it says this. He says, So that my bonds in Christ, so me being in prison for the sake of Jesus, are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. He starts off by saying this. He's like, my bonds, the reason I'm in prison and the reason he was in prison is because he was spreading the gospel. He had not done anything wrong by any breaking any laws. He just simply taught the gospel and there's people that hated him for it. And so he's in prison for it. So he's in prison now for the sake of Jesus. He says, these bonds in Christ have been made manifest. And this is such a cool word. In the original language of the Greek, this word manifest, it literally means like to shine forth. Like it's when something is so apparently clear that you could see it on the surface. You're like, yeah, that that goes one plus one equals two. It's so clear. And so this is what he's saying. My bonds in Christ and Christ living through me, going through this pain, it's been made clear to those that are in this a part of Caesar's household. These are, that are part of the palace. So this palace, it's this word praetorium. And so what would happen was this. Caesar had his palace. And then right outside of the palace was the praetorium, which was where Caesar kept all of his guards and servants and things like that, right? And so what Paul is saying here is like, hey, my bonds in Christ and the reason this is happening and Jesus is being glorified even to those within the palace, even to these palace guards, even to those of Caesar's household. He goes on just a few chapters later in in chapter 4 and verse 22. He's writing to the church in Philippi again, remember, and he's writing this letter and he says, hey, the saints, those that are followers of Jesus, the Christians, they are saluting you. And he says, and especially those that are of Caesar's household. He's saying that there were saints, there were people that were followers of Jesus that had now been part of Caesar's household. Some of these guards had come to know Christ. Some of the, maybe even some of the family of Caesar himself had come to know Jesus. And they're saying, hey, tell those Philippians in the church there that we say hi. See, they came to know Jesus because of what Paul went through. And this is how the church in Philippi even started as well. When, when Paul was in prison, it was a Philippian jailer that saw Paul, right, going through this experience and him and his whole household came to know Jesus. They became saved. This is what Jesus says in Matthew five sixteen. In this context, Jesus is actually talking. He mentioned several times going through hardships and tribulations and even persecution And he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What Jesus is saying there is let your light shine. Just like that word Paul used, manifest. Let your light shine that in the middle of your hardship, in the middle of your pain, that they see your good works. They see your faithfulness to Jesus. They see the joy that you are experiencing and they then glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, when people see us suffer well, they see the difference that Jesus can make in their lives. They see us going through suffering, but we're going through that suffering and we still have this internal joy and this peace. They see the difference that Jesus makes. And pain just serves as a way to put you into contact with people that you can shine that light to. Right? You're going through sickness. You're going through um, something that's physical. And so you get put into the hospital. Well, guess what? You get put in the hospital, and now there's doctors and nurses that you get to shine the light of Christ to. Your car breaks down, and so you have to take it to the mechanic. And now you're around this mechanic that you get to shine the light of Jesus to. Or there's a house problem, and you got to have a repair person come in. All of a sudden, now they're coming into your house, and they see how you're handling this, and they see the light of Christ in you. 
See, if we have this attitude that these things happen to us, the pain that we're going through, the pain that we're experiencing can only serve to the furtherance of the gospel, then all of a sudden our pain has a purpose behind it and our pain has meaning. I mean, imagine living a life this way. Just imagine, imagine living your life where even the hardest things that you're going through, deep down you have an assurance that there's a purpose behind it. It's not just worthless. It's not just going to bring you down. You're like, no, this, this has a purpose. This has a meaning. God is going to do something with this. Imagine a life where you could take the worst pain that you're experiencing and you can flip it and experience joy even in the midst of that pain. See, that's what happens with Paul. His pain had a purpose, and the people that didn't know Christ, they were experiencing Jesus because they saw how he handled his pain. They saw the joy that he had, even in the midst of his pain. But it doesn't just affect those that don't know Jesus when we, when we live this way. It also serves as a testimony to other followers of Christ. So look, look here, and again in verse uh, 13, he says, My bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. And then he says, And in all other places. In verse 14, and many of the brethren, many of those that are followers of Jesus, that's the family of God there, many of the brethren in the Lord, they wax confident by my bonds and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He says, because there's been those Christians that are seeing me going through hardship, they're seeing me experience this pain, and they're seeing God get the glory through it, all of a sudden, that's emboldened many of these other followers that are hearing about this and seeing Paul go through this situation. All of a sudden, they're like, man, well, if he's going through that and God is providing for him, then I could do it too. And they become so bold in their faith, they start sharing the word of God without any fear in their hearts at all. And it actually leads to more people hearing about Jesus. Now, sometimes we think, we think well, you know what? I'm not the pastor, so I don't really have that great of influence on people. Or we think, well, you know, I'm not that special. I don't have this many abilities or talents. or I'm just a quiet person, and so I'm not really influential. But here's the truth. Someone is always watching. Someone's always watching you to see how you react, to see how you handle different situations in your life. Right? I know that even of the kids in our church, right? I have my own children, and I know that even when I don't think that they're watching, they're watching, right? They're picking up on how I handle situations and how I live life. And the children in our church, they see the adults and how they respond to one another and how they're living life. Or just newer people that come into our church that sit down, and they're watching the people that are sitting in these chairs, and they're saying, how are they acting? How are they showing each other love? You know, my, my dad experienced this. My dad didn't grow up in a church family, and uh, his parents went through a, a very brutal divorce when he was young. It really messed him up a lot of ways. And, but he said this when he was older, someone invited him to church. He said he walked into the building there, and there in the pews he saw families that were sitting together that loved each other. And he said, I want what they have. Someone is always watching us. The example that you're setting could be the very thing that causes someone else to deepen their walk with Jesus. So we're to live faithfully for Christ because people are watching how we're living through for Jesus. Let other people be inspired by your attitude, by your rejoicing, even in the pain that you may be experiencing. Be the reason that someone finds confidence when they're going through pain. You don't have to stand before crowds. You don't have to have the whole Bible memorized. You just have to have that joyful attitude that comes from surrendering your life and your pain to the purposes of God. You could be the one that inspires someone else to keep going, even when they're going through hardship. You could be that person that inspires them, so the person is, is crying out and say, this is hard, this is too difficult, it's getting me down, but I remember, I remember how they handled it. I remember how that person at church handled this same situation and they had joy and they had confidence even though it was hurting them even though they were going through pain they had this strength and if they had that strength i can too you can be the reason that someone is inspired to keep going to keep pressing on but what this requires it requires a changed attitude towards pain 
So we don't have to think of pain where pain is always means bad. And comfort always means good. Pain can bring about good things, and comfort can also be a very, very bad thing. Now, I love being comfortable. Like this is this is what I dream of looking like right here. That's me, okay? <laughs> All right, that's awesome. Garfield is awesome, right? And I don't know you. Some of you guys have been to my house, and there's in our house in our living room. There's this leather chair. It's 25 bucks. We bought it off some college kids when we first moved here. It's so broke down a little bit. The armrests are kind of messed up. But that thing, you can just sink into it, and then you're like on a cloud, right? And you can sit there, and I could sit there, and I could turn on the TV. I could grab my soda and a whole bag of Doritos, and I could sit there and be in total comfort, right? But here's the thing. that I would be absolutely comfortable. But if I live my life that way, eventually my body's going to start breaking down. Right? It's gonna lead to, yeah, it's gonna lead to my destruction in my life. <clears throat> that comfort can lead to destruction. But if I get up, if I get outside, if I go running, if I do some jumping jacks and some push ups, some lifting of weights, whatever, that's gonna cause pain, right? But it's gonna be good for me. It's gonna lead to my growth. And this is what we have to understand and have to have an attitude shift towards pain. I have to realize that growth happens in discomfort. The Bible talks about this a lot in many different scriptures that we don't have time to go into. But often we see that it's actually our growth and our growth points actually happen in times of discomfort. When we're not just totally comfortable and lazy and just thinking everything's okay, God can do great things through us even in the middle of our pain. He can grow us. You know what's comfortable? Sin is comfortable. Sin is easy to do. Faith, boldness, hope, that's uncomfortable. But when you live your life that way, you grow. Paul says in Philippians 4, and we'll get into the topic a little later, but Philippians 4.11, he says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And this comes right after he says, you know, I've been extremely hungry and I've been full. I've been cold and I've been warmed. I've had everything I needed and I've had nothing. And yet no matter what level I'm at, I have learned to be content. See, it's living on purpose, even in pain, can be a game changer for us, but also for others. Because we can influence those that don't know Christ, and we can be an example for those other followers to follow in our footsteps as well, to encourage them. And we can get encouragement, and we can grow, even in the middle of our discomfort. So the next thing, though, is even in that, when you have that mind shift, shift of, of thinking about pain differently and thinking about how God can use that for his purposes, other good things start, start to happen. Additional pains that come into your life only bring additional joy. Look what he says in, in verse 15. So Paul goes on. He says, hey, there's some that have been made bold to preach the word without fear. But in verse 15, he says this, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So there's this movie, I don't know if, if you've seen it before, um, it's called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly with Clint um, Eastwood, right? It's a spaghetti western. All right, some fans, all right. Um, but basically what happens in the movie is these three guys, they're going after this treasure, and the whole movie, their relationships are going back and forth, right? At some points in the movie, they're working together. Other points, they're betraying each other. At the end, one of them kills the other one, right? It's just their relationships are completely messy. And a lot of times when we're thinking of um, our relationships in our lives, this is a good, a, a good saying for it, right? Our relationships are good, bad, and ugly. You know, one of the things that can... <laughs> hurt us the most and cause the most pain in our lives is actually our relationships with other people. You know, um, car problems, health issues, that's all bad. But oftentimes it's people that cause us the most pain. It's good, buddy. <laughs> it's people that can cause us the most pain in our lives. And Paul is no different. He had these people in his life that caused him pain, that caused him hardship. So in verse 15, this is what he says. He says, some indeed, they preach Christ of envy and strife. And then he goes on in verse 16, some preach Christ of contention, 
not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So he points this out. This idea is that some were preaching out of envy. So here's what's happening. So Paul, at this point, had become pretty famous, okay? And especially in the Christian world and even all over the world for different reasons. He become pretty famous. He become pretty popular, right? He had started churches in so many different areas of the known world at the time. God had used him to start writing the scriptures and some of the books of the Bible. God uses Paul to write. So he's very well known. And so what happened is that because of that, there were some people that grew in envy of Paul's position. So now that Paul is in prison, some people were looking at this as like, hey, this is our chance now to get fame. It says there in verse 16, some preach Christ of contention. The Greek word for contention there, it literally translates to gaining political office out of some unjust means. Right. The idea is like you have this competitive greed. You're going to do whatever you can for yourself and to gain position. And that's why some people started to preach. They're like, oh, wow, Paul's away. Now it's my turn to get famous. So they went out and they started churches and they started preaching the gospel. But they weren't doing it, as it says in verse 16, they weren't doing it out of sincerity, out of truthfulness, out of pure goodness. Instead, they did it. At the, it says supposing to add affliction to my bonds. They did it as a way of kind of like rubbing it in Paul's face, out of a way of trying to get glory for themselves. And here's the thing we have to remember. Serving Jesus is never supposed to be about us or our own glory. It's supposed to be about him and him alone. So it doesn't matter if we're remembered. It doesn't matter if we're appreciated. It doesn't matter if we're loved for what we're doing. We are doing it for Jesus. Right? Look what, look what Nicholas von Zizendorf, he was a Moravian missionary, and he said this. Preach, die, and be forgotten. Preach, die, and be forgotten. That was it. He's, his point is just, hey, do what you live your life for Christ. Do what you're called to do. And don't try to heap to yourself fame or fortune on that. Live for Jesus and be forgotten about it. Jesus remembers our works to him, and that's all our lives are supposed to be about. These people, they were living for their own glory. They're just trying to get their own glory in preaching the gospel. And we see here that some people in our lives can be our biggest discouragers. They can hurt us time and time again. These people are actively trying to hurt Paul by trying to be competitive with him. People can bring us pain and they can bring us sadness. And Paul had those type of people in his life. But he also had encouragers as well. Look at verse 15 again. It says, some though preach Christ out of good will. In verse 17, he goes on, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. At the same time where there were some people that were just trying to enviously preach the gospel to hurt Paul, there were others that were stepping in because they needed to, and they knew it was the right thing to do. They did it out of a good will, out of a pure heart. It says they did it out of love, and the word love there is agape. It means a sacrificial love. It wasn't for themselves wasn't for their own gain. It was for someone else. It was for Paul. It was for Jesus. He says, and they did this because they knew that he was the, the defender of the gospel. They saw him put in prison. They said, well, man, someone's got to step up now. Someone's got to keep preaching. Someone's got to keep telling people about Jesus. So I'll do it. And they did it out of the right motives. See, they were inspired by Paul to do things for the right reasons, where the others were just trying to hurt him more, add affliction to him. It was like they were rubbing it in his face, right? My boys, they have this thing that they say, and I'm trying to teach them to not say it and not to be like this, but they think it's really fun to like show off and then to make you feel like FOMO, like fear of missing out, right? So they have this thing. Um, so the other day, uh, Haley and the boys, they had some chocolate cake, and um, I, I met up with them later, and of course, there's no more cake left. And so my boys go, Daddy, Daddy, guess what? I'm like, what? And they're like, we had chocolate cake without you right that's what they love to say that we did this without you all right don't you feel bad uh and that's really what these people were doing they're like hey paul look at us we're preaching the gospel hey paul look at us we're starting churches without you they were trying to rub it in his face they were trying to intentionally hurt him but here's how paul responds to this additional pain that's coming into his life verse 18 he says what then he says so what <clears throat> notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense, that means for the wrong reasons, or in truth, for the right reasons, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice. And yea, I will rejoice. 
He says here, it doesn't matter. You're going to do it for the wrong reasons, fine. Jesus is still getting the glory. Jesus' name is still being out there. See, for Paul, it was never about him. It was never about, hey, give me the glory. I want a bit the fame. It was only about Jesus Christ. And there's going to be those in our lives that are going to kick us around, that are going to try to hurt us, that are going to cause us pain, that are going to cause us suffering. Even sometimes our fellow believers sadly do this. But that should never be a reason for complaint. Instead, we have to realize if Jesus is getting the glory, if Jesus can work through this pain, then I will rejoice. And I will rejoice again and again. That's what Paul did. These additional problems and pains only led in his life to more rejoicing. And that's what it can be for us. Additional pains can serve to bring us additional joys. Because every additional pain we go through is just another opportunity for God to get the glory in our lives. And when we recognize that and live with that mentality, then that can bring us joy again and again and again. And it can bring us a confident hope and peace. Paul kind of goes and he ends it with these final two verses. He talks about his confidence in this. In verse 19, he says this. For I know. Listen, he didn't say I think. He didn't say I wish. This was confidence. He says, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. What he means there, he's not saying that he gets saved through this, not salvation, but he's saying that the, the painful situation that he's going through can be saved and can be redeemed for something good. That the hardship he's going through, that God can bring good through it. And he tells two reasons why. He says, through your prayers. He recognizes the power in praying for each other. And he says, you're praying for me. In the Philippians, he talks about that in the first chapter. Again, you've been praying for me and I'm praying for you. And that power of prayer is leading to God doing good things in my life, even through the pain. And he says, and through the supply of the Holy Spirit. we got to recognize and realize something that we forget often is that when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, God gives us his Holy Spirit. God the Spirit that lives and indwells us. That gives us power to live our lives. That points us in the right direction. As Jesus even said, the Spirit's going to serve to remind us of everything he has commanded us. The Spirit of God gives us the daily supply. So even when we're at our weakest, we can feel the strength of God with us. That's what he's saying here is that God is powerful enough to take our pain and turn it into something good. You know, and I, we, we often think of like, I was, I was studying with Tekoa the other day and we were reading Genesis chapter 1. And when we think of the creation story, we also think of all the beauty and things that God does, right? The big, awesome, beautiful things that do, God does. But we forget how the story starts sometimes, right? In verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then verse 2 happens. And in verse 2, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It started out as this dark, void, worthless piece. And God steps in, and he spoke creation into it. He spoke, and light appeared. He spoke, and the stars, and the moon, and the sun, and the universe appeared. He spoke, and the dry land arose. He spoke, and the animals came to be. He spoke, and all of this beauty came out of this darkness. And that's what God can do in our lives. He can take our dark and our pain and he can transform it and redeem it for something good. He can take our hurt and he can turn it into something spectacular. He can take our pain and he can bring comfort out of it. He can take us when we're weeping and we're feeling sorrow and he can bring laughter. He can take our loss and he can bring new life because our God is a redeeming God. He took Jesus who was beaten, dead, thrown into a grave, and three days later brought forth the resurrection. And God can do that in our lives as well. He is big enough to resurrect our pain for something beautiful. And we can have that confidence that Paul had. He says, I know that God is going to do this in my life. And he finishes up with this hope in verse 20. He says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I'll be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. It says this earnest expectation, right? And this is what one of the commentaries says, his name is Tittman, and 
he says in this it implies not mere expectation not like hey, i hope this happens maybe wishful thinking but this anxious desire of an anticipated prosperous issue in afflictive circumstances what that means is even when you're going through these hard circumstances even when you're going through this pain you can have this hope this expectation that God is going to do something big and great through it. He's going to turn it around in some way. He's going to bring something good that you can't see yet. But he's going to bring something good through the pain. And the good thing that he mentions here is that Christ would be magnified. He says, whether it's in my life or in my death, that Christ would be made known. See, Paul's greatest hope. The greatest expectation he had for his life, his dream, his supreme goal, the thing that he lived for, is that Christ would be made known through him. That he could point people to Jesus. That his life, or even in his death, would serve as a reminder to all that Jesus is Lord. And is that our hope? Is that our dream? Is that our goal? That no matter what, through the good times, through the bad times, through my pain, that Jesus will be magnified through me. I mean, we could pray that to God and just say, call out to God because he knows what we're going through. He understands our feelings. The Bible says we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our afflictions, but was in all manners tempted as we are yet without sin. That means Jesus knows what we're going through. He's experienced the pain of walking this earth. He understands our deepest hurts. And so we can call out to God and we say, God, Lord, this hurts. This is painful. I don't know what to do. I can't see the good. This is hurting me right now, Lord. But I just want people to see you. So, Lord, use your resurrection power. Resurrect this destruction into beauty. Turn this hardship into victory and this pain to joy. And let the world see you through me. That's the attitude we carry with us. And that's how we experience joy even through pain. Recognizing that there's something bigger to live for. You know, when, when Haley was going through labor with Tekoa, without meds, right? She said one of the things that kept her sane in that moment was repeat this saying to herself over and over again. She would say, God can bring good things through the pain. And she started thinking about the things that God does good even through pain and hardship. And keeping that on her mind allowed her to get through one of the most physically painful parts and experiences in her life. And then to see the culmination of that pain, to see that brand new baby looking up at her face. All of a sudden you realize that the pain that she endured was for something far bigger, something far more important than herself. Pain always has purpose when you're living for a purpose bigger than you. If you're only living selfishly, your pain will always seem worthless and meaningless and purposeless, useless. But when you have your life surrounded in trying to magnify Jesus Christ, something that's bigger than you, something that's bigger and will outlive you and has been around before you, when you live for that purpose, when you live for the purpose of all eternity and what God can use you to do here in your time on this earth, all of a sudden, even the most painful and hard experiences have purpose behind them. They have meaning to glorify Jesus. So whatever pains we go through, whatever hardships, we can find joy in what Jesus is doing through us. We can find joy that Jesus is able to take that pain and resurrect it for his good and his glory and for the good of others around us. We got to change that mindset. Saying, Lord, I'm living for you. My life is about you, and even in this pain that I'm going through, I pray, Lord, that you would get the glory, and that you would turn my pain into something good, and therein we can find joy. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day, and I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy that you show to us each and every day. Lord, I pray that you would be with us now as we sing your praises and we think and reflect on the words of this song and the words from your word today. God, whatever any of us are going through right now, there's one thing that is abundantly clear. We need you. We need you right now. We need you every single day. And Lord God, I just pray that you help us to honor and glorify you in our lives. And Lord, use our pains, use our hardships, use our sufferings to bring you glory and to bring good to others. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us, please?